The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. Hi, welcome to the latest episode of Mental Health Now. I'm your host, Matthew Shapiro from the National Alliance on Mental Illness New York State, or NAMI New York State. This episode will be the first of two episodes that are going to really look into different uh, mental health issues impacting children. Um, as a lot of our viewers know from previous years when we've had mental health uh, episodes, May is actually Children's Mental Health Awareness Month. But what a lot of people don't know is that April is actually um, Child Abuse Prevention Month. So today we're going to be looking about a lot of different issues revolving around uh, preventing child abuse and the long-term mental health uh, impact of child abuse and I'm delighted to be joined today by Tim Hathaway who's the executive director of Prevent Child Abuse New York State so welcome Tim. Thank you very much glad to be here. Oh, we're glad to have you so let's start out um, I'm sure a lot of people may not be familiar with uh, Prevent Child Abuse New York State and the work that you do so can you talk a little bit about sure. that? Sure absolutely so uh, we are a capital region based organization doing statewide work so we have um, initiatives that are happening um, all the way from Long Island to Plattsburgh way up north mm -hmm. all the way out to Buffalo and Erie. Um, so the work that we're doing really falls into three categories. The first of those is in the area of public awareness and helping people understand the issue of child abuse, but more importantly, we think the issue of how do we prevent child abuse because that's that's something that we can do and so things like pinwheels for prevention um, so if you've seen blue and silver silver pinwheels in your community that's coming out of our office mm -hmm. and the work that we do as well as a variety of public awareness things mm -hmm. like um, screenings of movies about mm -hmm. this issue um, helping people have public dialogue um, mm -hmm. opportunities those are those are important and things like this show mm -hmm. so the other or an other thing that our office does is a lot of training and technical assistance with community partners mm -hmm. and with families and communities. So how do we equip people with the tools to do prevention work? What does that look like? And, and how do we ensure that um, because prevention doesn't happen at the state capitol, mm -hmm. prevention happens really across the state in mm -hmm. communities and in families. So how do we get the tools out to people who can use them and need to use them. Let me jump in on that before sure. we get to the because yeah. that's really interesting. We talk a lot about this in, in previous episodes when we've discussed children's mental health issues. We kind of talk about, it, it's that common phrase that it takes a village. It's not one person who uh, can you know, help advance children's mental health. It's, you know, it's schools, it's families, it's friends. I mean, right. it's really, and I, I think that you, what you're really saying is that mirrors in, in child child abuse prevention as well, correct? Yeah, absolutely. We're, we really believe in our model from in terms of how we do our work organizationally mm -hmm. is to connect with with folks in communities mm -hmm. typically it's a kind of a cross sector or, or a kind of a cross cutting group in the community that has maybe some law enforcement maybe mm -hmm. some school maybe some early childhood people um, some, some health people some mental health mm -hmm. but getting people together around the table to really mm -hmm. talk about what do we need to do what are the concerns mm -hmm. and then how do we go about at a local community level mm -hmm. really trying to fix some of those things right, yeah and those are such critical uh, conversations that we need to have you know it was interesting you and I were talking before when a few episodes ago we talked about um, crisis intervention teams with police intervening mm -hmm. and people with mental illness but really I think there's, there's a certain training that needs to be done too because when you're interfering or interfering fear interfering ah, intervening with people who have child abuse that's a set a certain set of standards and I think police and first responders need to as right. well as schools and all the other partners you talked about so yeah it's so good the work you're doing and I cut you off but what was the, the third thing so yes the th the third thing um, along with public awareness issues and training and technical mm -hmm. assistance we also do public policy advocacy and the mm -hmm. reason that that is important is that there are a lot of decisions that are made at a local level and we'll talk mm -hmm. local first mm -hmm. but 
um, school districts make decisions mm -hmm. that impact families and children. Mm -hmm. um, there are counties and cities that make decisions about what's available in the mm -hmm. community. Is it family focused? Are there opportunities for families mm -hmm. that support their wellness and their mental health? Um, and we also know that there are a lot of organizations that make policies mm -hmm. and make decisions about how funds are spent mm -hmm. those are all important policy issues that mm -hmm. we think there's real dialogue that needs to be had about mm -hmm. that and then when we talk national and state level mm -hmm. policy decisions of course we all know that how dollars are allocated what programs are promoted and pushed to the front mm -hmm. um, how um, things like, and so for right now, there's there's issues about um, will people be able to report child abuse as adults mm -hmm. that they may have experienced? Those are all critical issues that yeah. we need to have some policy um, discussion about. Right, and maybe yeah. extending statutes of limitations right. or things like that. Yep. So it's, it's interesting, you know, you talked about the three things that prevent child abuse New York State does, which public awareness, community part, partnerships and public policy. It was great to see that all in action um, in the beginning of, of April, which I said is Prevent Child Abuse Month or Childhood Prevent Child Abuse Prevention Month, where you had this great event in front of the Capitol where you saw different kind of community partners there. You saw um, you know, politicians like Albany Mayor um, Kathy Sheehan and uh, Assembly members John McDonald and Pat Fahey, our, our local Assembly members, as well as kind of what we talked about, non-traditional community partners, the Valley Cats being yep. there and raising yep. awareness. It was great that you had the little kids there. It yep. just shows this type of collaborative effort. It was a great event. We were so excited to be a part of it. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's ask this. I think people have these ideas in their mind when they hear child abuse, but what are some of the common myths about child abuse that um, maybe f some of our viewers don't understand? Yeah, so... Um, one of one of the myths I think that that comes up immediately for people um, is this idea that child abuse is happening in somebody else's neighborhood, somebody else's family, somebody else's community. Mm -hmm. But but really, it's not it's not so much of a problem here. Right. Or it, it's really not that much of a problem, mm. you know. So, so one of the things that we want people to really understand is that this is an issue that cuts across all of our communities, cuts across racial boundaries, it cuts, cuts across mm. um, economic boundaries. What we think the truth is around that is that it's more important to think about what are the risk factors that families are exposed to um, because that's a more telling issue than if we talk about race or you know any of those other things that we start to kind of get our thoughts about when we say it's somebody else's kid, somebody else's family. Because somebody the, else's neighborhood community. Some, right, yeah. exactly. So the, the risk factors that we think about are families that are um, somehow isolated socially and that can happen in a lot of different ways, mm -hmm. right? So we think isolation is, oh, is that a family living way out in the country? Nope. Mm -hmm. That may be a family that, that is isolated because of particular issues going on. Mm -hmm. So sometimes substance abuse mm -hmm. can isolate families in a particular or way, right? Or mental illness. Mental illness right. can isolate families in a particular mm -hmm. way. A special education need can mm -hmm. isolate families. So there are a lot of different ways that families can get isolated. Mm -hmm. So that's a risk factor. Um, things so, like, but, uh, go ahead. I, I want to explore this because this, this yeah. is actually really interesting, that isolating factor, because this is, again, something, the mirrors between what you're talking about and what we talk about in the mental health field is so dramatic because everyone thinks, oh, this, it will... It can't happen to their family. It's not in our community, right, but right. you know, child abuse and mental illness cut across social economic boundaries, yep. racial boundaries. You know, communities. You'll find it everywhere. It's not, you know, just somebody else's problem, which is so problem. But that isolation is so interesting that you talk about because um, I think isolation. That what you're talking about, like. The human connection, you know, we talk about this with mental illness all the time. A lot of times when people have a physical illness, the community will run to support them. But when it's a mental illness or a special, all the things that you talked about, people run away from right. them. And, and right. 
it's a very, and that's really how NAMI got started, is to support families that felt that type of isolation because the, it does have more outcome than just the isolation. That's the abuse, more right. mental, it's, it's, right. yeah. it's a bad place to be. And, and so it, that's so important that we address that and, yeah. and keep connections. Go to yeah. that, it takes a village model we were talking about. Well, in terms of solutions too. Mm. So when we talk about how do we prevent child abuse, it's another myth. A lot of people kind of are like, well, we've had that problem for, for centuries. Mm -hmm. It's just part of human nature. Mm -hmm. But we can prevent this. And mm -hmm. in fact, the data is telling us, long-term data trends tell us mm -hmm. that we're actually making progress on child abuse. Mm -hmm. But one of the solutions is this issue of trying to address lack of social connection for families. And so how do we do that? What does that look like? So. If I go home and I pull into the drive and I close my garage door behind me and go into the house mm -hmm. and I never say, hey, to that family living mm -hmm. next door, mm -hmm. it's easy to do that sometimes. Yeah. But just sometimes those simple times when we mm -hmm. reach out to a family, reach out to somebody who may be struggling. We've all seen that child mm -hmm. in the grocery store, the parent in the grocery store who's struggling. So mm -hmm. the child's tantruming and our tendency is just to walk away and right, pretend it's right. not happening. But a lot of times, just a simple word that says, hey, we've all been there. Right. I know what you're going through. Mm -hmm. That opportunity to, to let other people know that we understand that there are other people mm -hmm. that, that care about their experience mm -hmm. and that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. That this isn't something that's just alone. So that, those simple things that we can do and there are a lot of other things too um, that we can look to help support families mm -hmm. but we know that these are issues that we can do something about mm -hmm. they're not always about spending lots and lots of dollars mm -hmm. sometimes it's as simple as as connecting more effectively with the kids in our lives mm -hmm. so um, all of us who have um, either been a parent mm -hmm. or who have had experiences with the kids, whether it's a niece or a nephew, mm -hmm. know that kids can be challenging. Mm -hmm. And that building strong relationships sometimes mm -hmm. with kids can be challenging. But really focusing on what's going on in the life of this child. Mm -hmm. How do I look at opportunities to build close connection with mm -hmm. those children? Mm -hmm. Those are ways that we really help strengthen kids, mm -hmm. strengthen families, and those are the things that, that prevent child abuse. Right. That, that, that's fantastic. You know, it, it's so interesting because you said something that really got me thinking. People, I, I grew up in New York City, and a lot of my friends who grew up here or didn't grow up in an urban environment don't understand that, they're like, do you feel a sense of community? And I, I think in some ways, as I'm thinking about this, it's easier, as I would tell people, is that each like apartment building's their own community, because yeah. in a lot yeah. of ways, you interact with your neighbors right. a lot more, you know, on the elevator and things like that, and I think you, you get to know people and, and mm -hmm. notice things, it, right. so it's it's so much easier, I think, in a, in, a non-urban or suburban area, people are in houses that right. you don't interact as much. And you know, what if you know you, you're used to seeing your neighbor's kid in the yard, but now you haven't seen him in a while? Is that something you should be? So it's, but I think there's so many question marks, and and people don't know what to do. And and we talked about this before. If you mentioned something too that I think that everyone might have had an experience like this, where you're in a supermarket and or or any sort of public place, and you might see someone yelling at their kid, or maybe even pushing. You know, people don't know. Uh, people have asked me this. What do you do in a situation like that? Sure. Do you, do you sure. interact? So, so this idea of, of what can a bystander do mm -hmm. to kind of break that up, yeah. and there and there are a few things that we really do encourage people mm -hmm. to do. For one thing, um, most of those instances are really predicated. They're about stress, mm -hmm. right? They're about a, a parent who's feeling stressed and emotionally overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. They're about a child mm -hmm. who is feeling some of that same tension mm -hmm. and reacting, responding to that. Mm -hmm. We encourage bystanders to really think about, A, their own safety, because mm -hmm. we don't want anybody to, to step in in a way that puts them in danger, puts them. But there are some things that you can do to kind of break that, that situation mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, sometimes just saying, hey, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, man, I have been where you're yeah. at. Yeah. It gets better from here. Yeah. You know, this is, it feels bad, or you know, I know you're stressed, but mm -hmm. A, it gets better from yeah. here. or to, to say to a parent, 
hey, you have the most beautiful baby yeah. I have ever seen. Mm. The, she is so mm. precious. Sometimes just those little no. things break that, that moment that of tension. Yeah. Um, and you can you can really be able to to you don't have to feel like you're all of a sudden stepping in and trying to do therapy. Right. right. But you're just breaking the tension, right. letting that parent know that somebody else is right. there and that somebody cares. Well, the other again, thing that we say too is that sometimes you do need to con like if there's mm -hmm. really a child that is in imminent mm -hmm. danger, you can contact um, child protective services and mm -hmm. the hotline. Mm -hmm. Let me give you that number too, because sometimes people mm -hmm. don't know that number. But one eight hundred or eight hundred one. 1-800-342-3720 is the child abuse um, hotline. Mm -hmm. If you call that number, you can report an incident mm -hmm. that is happening. Right. So it, it's really interesting. It goes back to kind of what you were saying before. You know, a lot of times we'll get uh, people ask us when we're talking about kids' mental health in schools. You know, what peers can do to help each other. You know, you a lot of times, you know, a kid will know their friends better than maybe their family does yeah. in a lot of yeah. ways. And you know, if you see changes in a person, to it's okay to ask if you're okay or to reach out. And yeah. kind of the same situation you were talking. It goes back to what you were saying before, and I just I keep thinking about this that isolation moment. So again, you see this incident in the store, and you're trying to defuse it. That person's not isolated anymore more and again right. maybe even making a joke about oh you should have seen my toddler when he was in right. the age exactly. you know, something like exactly. that where yeah. you're diffusing your, and you're letting that person know they're not alone yep. and I think that yep. we talk about that all the time letting people know that they're not alone and that it, there is a community and that it takes a community to support one another it's so important so you mentioned as well um, some of the data sets of, of what, what we're doing and what's been successful in preventing child abuse um, mm -hmm. can you talk about some of the strides we're making or you're making <laughs> Let, yeah, let let me talk about that, but let me go back to something you just said because uh -huh. I think it is really important. You mentioned you mentioned peers, mm -hmm. and, and so I want to talk about that because there's there's a myth mm -hmm. that's hidden in there too. Mm -hmm. um, so the myth oftentimes is that child abuse is um, perpetrated by a stranger, um, by you know some odd guy that's driving around in a white van, right? Mm -hmm, that's, right. That's, there's a subtext about that. The reality is, is that the vast majority of child abuse is actually um, perpetrated by a by a parent or a caregiver or someone that knows the child. So over 90% of child abuse and child neglect instances mm -hmm. are perpetrated by somebody that, mm -hmm. that the child knows. And then a piece of that and this is particularly connected with child sexual abuse. So again, mm -hmm. right, we, we have this stereotype about, you know, people that abuse kids sexually mm -hmm. are, you know, right. some sort of a predator or they're, you know, what we know is that upwards of probably about 40% of child sexual abuse happens between peers. So it's a child who may be older than the child who's, who's being victimized, mm. that child probably has had some sort of victimization themselves. Mm. And so now they're acting that out or perpetrating against mm. a younger child. And so that's a myth that's important to talk about. Mm. Peers, as you said, peers tend to have a special insight into the life of other children. It's important that we help kids have some knowledge and understanding mm -hmm. about this. And so our office does some, some work around helping equip parents with how to talk to their kids mm -hmm. about some of these issues. Because mm -hmm. parents have to be part of the solution here, right. right? Parents have to be able to talk with their kids mm -hmm. about what do you do if you recognize that one of your mm -hmm. one of your friends is struggling or seems really different all of a sudden yeah. they've had a big change in their life or if they're talking about hey something changed or mm -hmm. i've got a new friend who's really doing a lot of special things for me mm -hmm. some of those big changes that we see in kids lives if our kids can know how to talk mm -hmm. with their friends but then also be able to talk with other adults in their mm -hmm. lives about yeah. those issues that's important so so that's a piece i want to tuck in let's talk about data for just mm -hmm. a second cuz cuz this is an important point too in in the state of new york every year there are over 200,000 children who are part of a child abuse report. Wow. 200,000 children. Wow. When, so that's a report. When we talk about 
kids that are identified as actual victims of child abuse. So they've gone through a whole mm -hmm. process of, of exploration and investigation on this. That number comes down to about 65,000 kids. So if you think about Madison Square Garden, mm -hmm. we just filled Madison Square Garden three times mm -hmm. with, the, with the number of kids each year that are victims of child mm -hmm. abuse. That's a huge ripple effect across our state with the number of kids who really, really are impacted. Mm -hmm. So that's about one in every 20 kids wow. in our state. When we talk about subsets of that, if you look at children under the age of one, we start talking about one in every 27 infants in the state. It's a lot of kids, a lot of babies that are impacted by child abuse. Let me ask, because we talked about this before too, and we don't want to, you know, label people who might have a mental health issue as abusive, but I'm just curious, what role does postpartum depression play in that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so um, probably about somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of the cases mm -hmm. of reported child abuse are actually reported as neglect cases. Mm -hmm. That so, Somehow the child is not meeting the needs of the child and that doesn't have anything mm -hmm. to do with whether or not the parent is rich right. or poor so mm -hmm. you can't re right. report neglect based on a poverty situation. Mm -hmm. But it's whether or not the parent is meeting the needs of the child emotionally, mm -hmm. socially, in terms of school or mm -hmm. medic medicine, health, those kind of things. Postpartum depression, what mm -hmm. we know that does for, for women that are, are um, struck with that mm -hmm. is it disconnects in some ways that woman from some of the emotional connectedness that they have, mm -hmm. right? So depression oftentimes, um, postpartum de depression especially, kind of causes the woman to withdraw mm -hmm. from relationship. And when you're withdrawing from relationship of mm -hmm. that infant mm -hmm. who desperately needs that connection mm -hmm. to be able to, to right. really talk, there are some um, people have talked about there is no infant outside of a mother. So that's how important that connectedness is. The baby can't thrive unless they're connected. So depression is an important piece of this and postpartum depression plays right into this. Doesn't mean that, that that's a, a woman who doesn't care for that kid, who doesn't love that kid. It just means that they're in the middle of some sort of a crisis for themselves. They need help and support getting through that. Yeah, and I think we need, to, uh, we all need to, but NAMI too needs to do more to educate fathers or spouses about postpartum depression and, and to, the quicker we identify it and get the help the quicker everyone you know it's better for everybody so um was there more data or successes that we should be yeah. uh talking about so so let's talk about successes a little bit because there are some clear things that work mm -hmm. um so we know that screening is an is an underused mm -hmm. tool around this issue of child abuse um prevention we screen for diabetes, right? Mm -hmm. We screen for heart disease. Mm -hmm. And the reason we screen is because we know mm -hmm. if we pick that up early, mm -hmm. we're going to A, save, save mm -hmm. lives, we're going to reduce medical costs, mm -hmm. and we're going to make sure that people have happier, healthier, healthier lives. Right. We can do the same thing for child abuse. There are clear risk factors that we can screen for mm -hmm. that, that work. So that's a place that we need to put more attention and more mm -hmm. effort. We also know that there are um, specific um, programs and opportunities that we have in communities mm -hmm. that we haven't utilized enough. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, home visiting programs mm -hmm. where we can get people connected socially mm -hmm. into the community. Mm -hmm. We know those programs work. We know that the results right now for Healthy Families mm -hmm. in New York, that program has reduced child abuse by up to 50% wow. with participants. That's pretty amazing. That if we could amazing. cut that number of abuse victims in half, that'd be amazing. We also know that there are programs like parenting education mm -hmm. that where we normalize this idea that mm -hmm. all parents need help. It's mm -hmm. not it's not right. bad to reach out and right. ask for help. Right. That really helps it's too. It's kind of like we joke, you know, you need to take a, a six hour course before you get a driver's license but anyone, and, and right. anyone can have a baby. But right, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So, so um, th mm. those are some good successes mm. that, that we have. I think um, what we also know is that communities that mm -hmm. pull together around this issue mm -hmm. and decide that they're going to take on specific mm -hmm. risk factors mm -hmm. in the community to try and help mm -hmm. families 
those successes, that's where we have real success. Mm -hmm. We don't prevent child abuse here mm -hmm. in the state capitol. Right. The legislature doesn't prevent. Mm -hmm. Where child abuse is prevented is when communities get together, mm -hmm. they decide we're going to do something about mm -hmm. this issue, and they make a plan and get organized mm -hmm. and pull together for right. it. So we only have about two minutes left, but really quickly, I think it's really important that we talk and just touch on the long-term impact of abuse and why it's so important that we nip I, mean, I think some of it's obvious, but maybe not everyone is as familiar with things like the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, ACEs. So in like a minute, can you quickly yeah, talk sure. about that? So so that study was really the, the first time when there was a clear scientific link between this idea that when kids go through experiences mm -hmm. like child abuse, and sometimes mm -hmm. like mental health disorders, mm -hmm. substance abuse in mm -hmm. a family, loss of a parent member, those things hang on and they translate mm -hmm. into real health impacts. Mm -hmm. Heart disease, mm -hmm. um, certain types of cancer, mm -hmm. um, the uh, tendency to towards things like alcohol abuse, mm -hmm. substance abuse, towards depression. Mm -hmm. Those are real health impacts. We know that if we intervene early with kids, mm -hmm. that it changes that actual health trajectory as well as the emotional impact. So some of the other things that that ACE study found, Adverse Childhood Experiences study found, is that people who have not had the sort of support mm -hmm. early have a more difficult time maintaining employment. So now we're talking about we're impacting the tax no, base, no. right? Mm -hmm. um, they had a much more difficult time in terms of social interactions. Mm -hmm couldn't stay married, right. couldn't maintain a good solid mm -hmm. relationship, and that just spins this into second generation mm -hmm. impact, right. third generation. Yeah. So now you have families that are dealing with mm -hmm. these impacts over yeah. time. Well, so. That's why, it, you know, again, the work that you're doing is so crucially important, and, and, and thank you so much for being with us today and really educating on our, our viewers that everyone does play a role in preventing Absolutely. child abuse. I mean, yep. you guys work so hard, but you can't do it alone, and it yep. does take a community, and we want to let our viewers know again like I said um, April is uh, a, a childhood prevention month and, and May is childhood mental health awareness month and again to learn more about these issues we, we would invite all of you to come to the what's gray in our state event which will be taking place on uh, May 8th at the New York State Museum Huxley Auditorium from 1 30 to 4 30 it's a free event and it honors programs and people who are really addressing uh, children's mental health issues including some of the trauma we've, we've been talking about today and uh, again Tim I thank you and uh, I thank our viewers for watching and remember that everyone does have a hand in being a good community member and preventing child abuse and as we say here on Mental Health Now hope starts with you so we'll see you next time thank you